This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the last of the lectures on Chapter 15 of the Single P2 Notes, uh, the chapter on pricing. And on the last page of the uh, chapter, uh, you'll see our heading Pricing Strategies, which I'm going to run down this list explaining. Uh, but different strategies you may, a company may employ when they're fixing a selling price over and above what we've done earlier, this idea of normally wanting to sell at more than cost and so on and so on. But here's specific strategies you might employ in specific situations. And to explain precisely what I mean, first of all, penetration pricing. Penetration pricing is mainly when we've got a new product and we want to get into the market, we want to gain market share, and we do it by initially fixing a low selling price, maybe even a loss-making price. For instance, suppose I'm going to start making chocolate. We've never made chocolate before, it's a brand new product for us. There are plenty of competitors, people are quite happy buying the competitor's chocolate. Why should they suddenly buy mine when they've never heard of it before? And the way we might try and achieve it is charge a low price initially, hoping that uh, customers will try our chocolate. But always we intend later to increase the price to a normal profitable level. And okay, there's a risk obviously when we increase the price, customers may switch back to the existing brands. But what we're hoping is that, of course, they'll have liked our chocolate and they'll stay with us. So uh, that's what penetration pricing, uh, pricing is. It's a low price initially in order to try and gain market share. Uh, but without me writing it, appreciate it's to try and get market share, but the intention always is to increase the, right, uh, the price later to a, what you might call a realistic level. The next one, market ski skimming. Initially, this might sound a bit odd, but it's a high price initially. And, uh, without me writing, uh, with the intention of reducing over time. And let me again give you an example. Flat screen TVs, I don't know how old you are, but um, I can certainly remember when flat, flat screen TVs first went on the market, they were incredibly expensive. I remember seeing some at 10 or 20,000, the very first that were there. And of course, very few people could afford them, but there are always some people, uh, some rich people who like to be the first to have some new technology. There are always some people who will pay a high price, but obviously a limited number. And so what's happened since? Started off at a very high price, they don't sell that many, but they make a huge profit on them. But when they run out of rich people, they drop the price a bit, and people, perhaps still rich, but a bit less rich, they can afford to buy one. And they drop it more, until gradually the price now has come down so hugely that now um, anybody who wants one more or less can afford one. And they could have charged a very low price from the very beginning. They'd have had huge sales. But the profit on each would have been fairly small. So what they've done is over a, a, a longer period they've still ended up selling to everybody. But rich people have paid a lot. Poorer people have paid less. We've all paid what we could afford. So they may, it's taken them longer to sell huge numbers. It does mean that overall they've been making a greater profit. Now that only works with certain products. It's primarily high-tech products where you know, some brand new invention comes on the market. The same happened with DVD players when they first came out. 
very expensive at the beginning, but now, relatively speaking, very cheap indeed. So I say it's only certain products, tends to be high tech. But if we're making that sort of product, again, it's a strategy worth considering. Lost leaders, I don't think I need to write here. I can explain that well enough in words. It's something I think you've all seen, particularly in supermarkets, that you'll get a supermarket advertising a particular product, very cheap, maybe loss making. And why are they prepared to make a loss on it? Because if they can attract you into the supermarket, they're hoping obviously while you're there, you'll buy lots of other products that are, are, are profitable for the supermarket, and that overall the profit will get from these other products more than compensates for the loss on this particular one. Thank you. It's very common if you see sugar being sold at half price in a particular shop. I think very likely you might go to that shop to get the sugar. And again, clearly they're hoping, as again it's likely, that while you're there you'll buy other goods uh, where they are charging normal prices. Uh, product bundling and optional extras not quite the same, but more or less. Let me give you two examples. Have you ever seen on sale uh, perhaps a bottle of shower gel and a bottle, the same company, a bottle of uh, shampoo taped together? Uh, and if you buy the two together, it's cheaper than buying the two individually. That's an example of product bundling. All right, it may make, because the two together is cheaper than it would have been if you'd bought the two separately, they may be making less profit for the two, but it increases the sales overall. So, you know, people who may normally only buy the shower gel, and they don't know, they normally buy a different type of shampoo, if they can see the two together, it's going to save them money. Fine. They're buying our shampoo that they might not otherwise have bought. Optional extras, what about cars? Cars, you know, clearly the same model car. There's a range of different prices depending on what extras that you might choose to buy. You know, they want as much money off you as they can. But if, if all the cars came with ooh, a leather, if, if our particular model, if all, all, the only model we saw sold always came with leather seats and leather steering wheel and everything, it'd be more expensive and a lot of people wouldn't be able to afford to buy it. So we sell a basic car with plastic seats. If you want, you can pay extra and have it with leather seats. <coughs> an optional extra, but yeah, uh, same sort of idea as something I mentioned earlier, that poorer people are by the cover of plastic seats, richer people might pay the extra and get leather seats, even though the car itself is primarily what we want to sell uh, and where we're making money. Uh, finally, of these main ones, product differentiation, I mentioned cars a minute ago, and obviously there are lots of manufacturers of cars. And for a certain level of car, you know, obviously there are small cars, big cars, different what you might call levels. But for any particular level of car, there are lots of different manufacturers of what are very similar cars in terms of um, the power and the looks and everything else. So how do we persuade people to buy our car and not a competitor's? We try and convince them that our car is better. And if we can convince them that our car is better than the competitor's, then perhaps we can charge a bit more, a bit more for it. So clearly we've got to 
do something with that makes our car better uh, in order to justify the higher price. Uh, finally, other strategies, perhaps marginally less important, but even so, the first one, price discrimination. This is a nice one. It is a fact, I want to mention coffee again. It is a fact that a jar of coffee in India is cheaper than the same jar in Europe. Same manufacturer. Nescafe or whatever, you can buy the same coffee a lot cheaper in India than you can in Europe. And why? I mean, with some products obviously it may be cheaper to manufacture uh, in India and they can afford to charge less. But even if it's identical, even if it's manufactured in the same factory and then sent to either India or Europe, why do they charge more in Europe? we do in India? And the answer is quite simple. People can afford more in Europe. If people can afford more, charge them more. You know, I'm making up figures, obviously. Suppose the cost to manufacture a jar of coffee is 50 cents. Okay, anything more than 50 cents will be profitable. Maybe people in Europe can afford to pay two dollars so the selling price in Europe, $2, nice big profit. No point in trying to sell it for $2 in India, they can't afford it. And so what do we do? We say, all oh, right, in India, we'll just charge a dollar. Anything more than 50 cents is making us more profit. But we charge as much as we can, the people can afford in the place we're selling it. Now that's geographical discrimination, and that's getting harder and harder. All right, coffee. People in Europe aren't going to fly to India just to buy coffee because it might be cheaper. Uh, but more and more, with the internet in particular, you can, not everything obviously, but more and more you can buy things from other countries. Uh, and this geographical differentiation or discrimination uh, it's getting harder to achieve. But it's all over the place. Uh, computers. The big computer manufacturers, Apple and all of them, they offer an educational discount. If you're a student, you can get it cheaper than if you're not a student. Whether that this applies to senior students or not, I don't know. There's certainly a student in a a, a, an established school or university. And why? Why? It's the same product, it costs the same to make. Why should I have to pay one price and a student can get the same thing for $100, $200 less? Well, all right, it's good publicity for them. Oh, we're letting students have our computer cheap. But the two reasons they're doing it, one is obviously uh, well, Apple's a good example. If students start using an Apple computer, hopefully they'll carry on, Apple hopes they'll carry on using the same computer when they're no longer students, and when they replace, they'll be paying full price. But it's more than that. Non-students may be able to afford to pay, let's say, $2,000 for a computer. So, Fine, they'll charge $2,000. Students can't afford to pay $2,000, but a bit like the coffee. If it only costs them, oh, $1,000 to make it, if we'll pay $2,000, charge $2,000. We'll still pay $2,000, but if a student, oh, a student can only afford $1,500, let them buy for $1,500. We make more sales. Overall, we make more profit. <clears throat> it's almost an artificial rule that we've created where different segments of the market are charged different prices according to how much we think they can afford to pay. Uh, next one, premium pricing. This is a clever one. 
If you go into a shop, I'm sorry, you're probably bored with coffee, but I'll choose to coffee again. If you go to a supermarket and you see one jar of coffee is priced at a dollar, and next to it is another one priced at five dollars, which one do you assume is better? You assume, obviously, that the five dollar one must be better coffee. And all right, you may still buy the cheap one, but if you can afford the five dollar one, you might say, oh, I'll get that, it must be better. But of course, you don't know it's better. The point is, the price itself has that impact on you and makes you feel it must be better. So it's another strategy. Uh, it's a dangerous one, obviously, because there are always some people who uh, clearly want to save money and buy the cheaper one. And the question is, how much extra do we charge? But um, it's, it's psychological. As the next one is, but for a rather different reason. Um, all this is, well, again, I'm not going to try and write it down, but an example. You've all seen, all of you, have seen where you're going to a shop and the price of something is 9.99. Now, why isn't it $10? You know, all this messing around with a uh, small change. It doesn't really, one, one cent doesn't really make a, a difference to anybody. You'd still, if you want it, you'll still pay 10. But it's psychological. People think that 9.99 is cheaper than it actually is. You know, it's, it's the nine that you look at rather than the 99 that comes after it. And it's funny, we all know that happens. We all know um, why they're doing it, but we still fall for it. 9.99 looks cheaper. Uh, finally, predatory pricing, which in most countries is actually against the law, it isn't always the easiest thing to prove. It's where you deliberately undercut the competition in order to put competitors out of business. One example, a long, it's a long time ago this, but in the UK, British Airways, well, it used to be the only real big airline in the UK. Uh, they did have a, almost a monopoly for UK people. And they made a lot of money on flights to and from America, Virgin Airlines started and proved huge competition. And so British Airways on flights to America dropped the prices massively and in fact were making losses on flying to America. Lots of profit elsewhere, they were a huge company, they could afford to make short-term losses uh, on flights to the US. Virgin was starting up. Well, they couldn't afford to compete with British Airways prices. They just couldn't charge that less. You know, they haven't got many routes. Uh, British Airways ended up getting fined for it. They were deliberately trying to put Virgin Airlines out of business. And then, of course, they could put the price back up. Well, that's predatory pricing. Uh, we're charging a loss maker price to put new entrants in particular out of business. Okay, I hope that made sense.